Good afternoon, and welcome to the Match Grinding webinar presented by Hans Yulchi and Tom Vera of United Grinding North America and Frank Powell of Marpos. My name is Don Nelson, publisher of Cutting Tool Engineering Magazine. I will be the host of today's webinar on match grinding. Match grinding is to accurately grind a part like a spool or piston external diameter to a sleeve internal diameter in order to keep the two parts as a pair. The process assures a tightly controlled clearance between the two parts. We're going to get started in just a bit, but first I would like to explain the procedure for asking questions during the presentation. On the right hand side of your screen is a panel with a box into which you can type questions at any time during the presentation. After the presentation, United Grinding and Marpos representatives will field as many questions as they can. If they cannot get to your question, they will respond to each of them via email. I'd also like to recommend that you turn off your cell phone during the webinar to prevent distortion. With that said, I would like to go ahead and introduce our presenters. Hans has been in the grinding industry for many years in various capacities, including grinding applications, sales and process engineering, and grinding systems integration. As Vice President of the Cylindrical Division of United Grinding, Hans is responsible for sales and adaptations of Studer Schout Microsa in North America. Frank Paul was hired at Marpos in 1981 as a service engineer. He then became manager of the repair department, then service specialist for grinding gauges and controls. He was promoted to proposal engineer for grinding systems. Next, he became product manager for grinder controls, and currently he serves as product manager for grinder products. Tom Vieira has been in the grinding industry for over 32 years. He has worked with many different kinds of grinding machines, grinding a wide array of different parts and different metals. Tom has been running Studer CNC machines for over seven years before joining United Grinding North America as an applications engineer and is now the applications manager for the Cylindrical Product Technology Group. We're going to start things off with Mr. Hans Yulchi. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us today for this uh, match grinding seminar. First, I'd like to go over the agenda that we have, and as you see, uh, the first item here is the question of what and why match grinding. And when we talk about match grinding, typically in this seminar, it's going to be about cylindrical grinding. Uh, then we go to the principles, so the principles of match grinding some advantages and disadvantages, studer experiences in regards to quality, practical examples, gauging solutions by Marpos, and then we come to the question and answer session answered by Tom and Frank. So what is match grinding? As we said in the intro, match grinding is grinding an OD of a piston or a spool and grinding this to the internal diameter of a sleeve. So in this particular case, we're grinding to hold a clearance versus grinding to hold a size. This example shows that uh, the clearance in red is held to a very tight tolerance. Typical items in match grinding or required in match grinding are a pre-gauge, in-process gauging, uh, measuring heads in that example, and also in some cases post-process gauges, as you will see later in this presentation. Of course, this include, includes uh, communication systems to and from the grinding machines and to the gauging systems. Match grinding has been around for quite a long time. So as you can see on some of these in the, in the left-hand picture on a Studer approximately 30 years old, uh, match grinding has been implemented already back then. Today, of course, we do match grinding on more modern machines as well as machines that are automated like the picture on the right-hand side uh, displays. 
So the question is, why match grinding and gauging? What are the drivers? Well, we want to eliminate the class fitting. Also, there is no trial and error work. Um, we can automatically create tight fits or tight fit seats to the sleeves. The process also reduces the whip, so we have no or very little work in progress. It also gives us a just-in-time production. It provides us with uh, accurate traceability, especially important in the aerospace industry. Of course, it provides improved quality. It reduces pre-machining. In our case, when we talk about pre-machining, it, it uh, refers to grinding of the sleeve or of the bores. And also, um, of course, it requires less operator influence than normal grinding. So some principle and variations. This example shows how we gauge a bore or gauge a sleeve with a scanning gauge or a contact gauge, as we will see later on in this presentation, and sending the signal to the amplifiers of the gauging system onto the machine tool through the interfaces and grinding the uh, piston or the spool on the grinding machine with either one or multiple measuring heads, including sometimes using automatic taper correction, like indicated on the right-hand bottom side. Here we have uh, match grinding level one, as we uh, define it. So in level one, basically, we measure, we measure the bore in one plane, and we measure the plunger in one plane. In match grinding level two, we measure the bore in two planes, and we gauge the plunger in two planes. This gives you the possibility to make taper corrections. And we get into the details on that a little bit later. This picture also shows the possibilities to grind, the, uh, to match the plunger to a taper or to a straight based on the large diameter or both diameters of the sleeve or the small diameter. These are the possibilities. If we go to match grinding level uh, three, this also then includes a post-process feedback system. And typically this system is then incorporated into an automated cell. So as this uh, schematic uh, de depicts, shows um, different parts in a different process. So for instance, we're grinding part three here. We're feeding back to in-process control and we're taking the values of a memory that's stacked from a previously gauged part, uh, sleeve number three. In the meantime, we're also measuring number two or we have measured number two and measured number one and these um, measuring values are stored in a memory waiting for the part to make it from the loader through the loader pickup arm into the machine. Also considered here would be a post-process signal either through a trend correction or a fraction of a value in order to create a closed loop system. This gives us perfect stability throughout the day in an almost unmanned um, system. So again, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the match grinding uh, process? So first, um, mainly the advantages, as we said earlier, you have a perfect matched pair. You can reduce the pre-machining May basically by not controlling the tolerances of the sleeve as tight as without the process. You can do an automated match system 
you have a closed loop system possible. We can create superior quality and we have reduced work in progress. If there is a disadvantage, it could be looked at as the fact that the uh, logistics, once the two uh, work pieces are paired and must stay together throughout its life. So what's the studer experience that we have had producing tight fit clearance tolerances? First of all, we can produce or we can match grind on most of our OD grinding models. So, for example, they can be a manually or hydraulically or electrically in-feed grinding machine as well as any CNC machines. As an example here is match grinding of a needle. In this particular case, uh, on line number one, we show a match grinding clearance tolerance of 1.5 microns. Grinding this 1.5 microns tolerance, the actual tolerance used in the system was 1.1 micron. So now I'm going to show a practical example of the different options that I mentioned before on the different levels and some of the pros and cons of this. So this, there are many ways again to grind, match grind of plungers. So this demonstrates a possible option for match grinding of plungers. These options consider the matching to be done in the grinding machine according to the bore of the body always being gauged. So that means, again, this is a, a, a match grinding setup. The variance may differ in cycle time or setup times and, of course, cost. Each option will have positive and negative attributes, as you will see. So when choosing a system, it's best suited that we look at drawings, looking at the desired cycle time of the proposed system, to looking, uh, considering the pre-machining of the body and also of the plungers, the desired quality and the choice of automation. So the different options here again are option number one, mainly measuring one diameter on the sleeve and on the tape on the uh, plunger. Option number two, A and B, will typically be a match grinding using two uh, levels of uh, gauging. One of them with manual taper correction and B with automatic taper correction. And then we have again level or option number three that allows to use post-process gauging in an automated cell. So, option number one, again, repeating measuring diameter one in one plane in the bore and also measuring in one plane on the plunger. And there is no post-process gauging involved. So in this case, the pre-machining um, requires more uh, precision because we don't take into account taper. So again, on the in-process gauging, we have one gauge head grinding to a fixed taper. We have, a, have to do a manual taper adjustment. The pre-process gauging is one bore measurement taken and values transmitted to the gauge, to the machine gauge. There is no post-process gauging. Regrinding parts are possible in, in particular cases for when we do flow values or flow testing. So here we listed the strengths and weaknesses of this particular single plane gauge. So we have to do accurate pre-machining or more accurate pre-machining. So it may require longer cycle times because of the uh, manual adjustments. So that means less machine output uh, on the pre-machining. Of course, on the, the in-process gauging is cheaper or costs less. The cycle time may be longer because of the manual adjustment of tapers. 
So that again requires um, looking at the cycle times. Um, it means in regards to working hours, uh, lower output, but also a lower setup time because it's a more simple system. The workpiece quality may not be as high as level two and three. So option 2A means we have two diameter gauge heads on the in-process gauging to control for taper with a manual adjustment of taper. That means the adjustment of this center here occurs manually. Grinding of the bore gauge, um, grinding to the gauge bore in one level. There is no post-process gauging. So in this particular case, we have less, the pre-machining can have less variance. The in-process gauging requires manual taper adjustment. The pre-process gauging has one bore measurement taken and the value is transmitted to the machine. Again, in this case, there's no post-process gauging. Strengths and weaknesses on this particular case. Pre-machining is required. In-process gauging cost is lower than 2B because it doesn't have an automatic taper correction system. The increase, it has an increased cycle time due to the fact that it's a manual taper adjustment. Um, there is a, the working hours uh, requires less setup time and less because there's no automation. The workpiece quality is medium. It's less quality than the 2B and 3 option because it's less automated. The 2B option is more automated because we have the taper correction automatic. This is again the adjustment of the taper on the tailstock side. So we have two diameter gauges inside of the bore and we have two diameter gauges on the uh, plunger and typically spaced the same uh, to each other as the bore. So the pre-machining is shorter and is basically not required because we can consider if a bore is tapered and we can match that to either a taper or a cylindrical part. Again, we have two diameter gauges and we have automatic taper adjustment through a closed loop system from the machine. This is basically an NC axis. Pre-process gauging in the bore is on two planes and again both signals are transmitted to the machine gauge. Again here there is still no post-process gauging. Strengths and weaknesses in process gauging it's a higher investment because of the automatic taper adjustment. The pre-process pre gauging is, has increased cycle time or increases cycle time. The working hours, it's high automation, it's a higher setup time. The workpiece quality is a higher capability because it's higher automation without the having to do manually taper adjustment. So that reduces the scrap. So option number three. This is a fully automatic taper correction, also incorporating uh, post-process signals. So again, here we're measuring the part in two planes. We're measuring the bore in two planes. And also the post process is measured in two planes. So again, there is no pre-machining or less pre-machining required from the sleeves. The in-process gauging has two diameter gauges with automatic taper adjustment, NC axis. The pre-process gauging uh, is gauging in two planes and the post-process gauging 
uh, is also measured in two planes, which either feeds back as a, a fraction of a correction or as a trend. So the strength and weaknesses in this particular case are there's less pre-machining. Uh, of course, this is the highest cost option due to the complexity of the uh, gauging system as well as the machine options with automatic taper correction. It requ requires a little bit higher cycle time due to the fact that it automatically adjusts the taper during grinding. Um, Pre-process gauging. Additional space is required in the loader as uh, the, the gauge typically is placed inside the loading cell. Cycle time addition may be possible due to the fact that uh, the, the gauge cycle may be longer than the grinding cycle or may have to be balanced with the grinding cycle. So it's a higher cost. Post-process gauging, the cycle time may be shorter, however, um, a higher cost to the post-process gauge. This also requires a higher setup time in order to tune up the, all the gauges with each other and the grinding process. From the workpiece quality, it's the highest capability, the least scrap, and also automated to the highest possible scenario. I now like to give the word to Frank Powell. He has a lot of example of, of the gauging systems that I have discussed now and uh, showing a lot of parts that they have ground and measured at Marpos. Okay. Thank you, Hans. Good afternoon. As introduced, my name is Frank Powell. I'm the product manager of Grinder Products for Marpos Corporation here in uh, North America. And what I'd like to do is sort of give example in the approach that we take when uh, asked to provide systems to, uh, for match grind. Picture of typical parts that are used for match grind, various types of sleeves and spools, uh, injector bodies and hydraulic control components, and even pump gear systems. When we look at gauging as a whole, there's a lot of different considerations. When you look, think of gauging, there's what is normally considered traditional gauging. Gauging that is done by, by hard gauges, to, done by some electronic gauges that have a, a, a traditional large tolerance, a large flexibility. And in the middle of that or after that, we have also the what we call the high-tech traditional. These are ga gauges that are applied to processes that have tolerances like in the 5 micron or less range. Then, of course, on the high end of it, in the case of this one, lower end is our, is our submicron. Submicron, we have a lot more considerations to take. When choosing a tool, we have to look at how the gauge has to be applied. There's a trade-off when you talk about resolution versus measuring range. If you have to have a lot of measuring range in a traditional gap location where you have large tolerances, so the measuring range is considered large, you are going to have to lose some resolution. Tighter the tolerance, the more we have to calculate well, to the right of the decimal point, we start losing re we start uh, losing range because you can only have a transducer has so much working range that allows us. Typical applications that we do is matching as as Hans showed before various types of of bodies to spools, seat distances for plungers for for uh, ejector valves, and uh, Diameters match to, to other components like two-piece uh, shims and, and bodies. A whole process of this thing is to keep the, keep the process tight and under control. Submicron is what we're trying to do uh, in, in the world of, of match grinding. When we're choosing the proper equipment, we have to make sure that we can produce it within the realm of, of, of uh, the customer requirements. That includes having a system that offers precision and accuracy because the two aren't necessarily synonymous. Precision, you can have a highly precise gauge that can, it has a problem with accuracy and vice versa. So we must make sure we fall within that. The other consideration we must have, of course, is the environment we're, we're operating in. That the time from the time the part comes from the machine to the time that we check it is consistent because when you're putting uh, energy into a part in the process of machining 
energy is going to be released in the form of heat as it cools afterwards. And if you have a variation, especially in extremely tight tolerances, in that time, from the time it leaves the machine to the time it's gauged, you can introduce another form of error. So we want to make sure that this automated systems are obviously the best to protect us when you're talking in the submicron range. Another consideration is the part itself, is the size of the part and how we approach it, especially for bore measurement. As you can see in this, this illustration here, if I start with a part that has a 5 millimeter radius or 10 millimeters in diameter, and I'm off of center line by just 30 microns, I have a 0.22 micron error just because of the, of the chordal error, we call it. If I go half the diameter, I go three times the error. So you can see it's, a, it's, a, it's an exponential point. So if I'm having a, the smaller the bore I have, the more consideration I have to have in how I gauge that piece to reduce as much as possible the effect of the chordal error. Also considerations, we have to look at systems that are going to give us repeatability, are going to give us stability and reproducibility. Repeatability is always checked on a master, that I can put the master in a hundred times and I repeat within a given range that's agreed upon at the beginning, usually 10% of the tolerance or one micron, whatever's left. The other is the re reproducibility. Can I get the same results or with, from multiple operators? And of course, stability. If I check parts at one point in time and I check them at another point in time, am I going to get the same results or not? The other thing we have to consider, of course, is setup. I have a master that I have to set my gauges to. If I have to, depending on the tolerance, I may want to always make sure that I put a correction in for the master deviation. No master is perfect. I have, I'll always have a variation from the ideal nominal to what the reality is after the master is produced and I can put a compensation in the system. So when I zero the gauge, I zero it, taking into consider that deviation. And of course, last is correlation. The correlation, if I am going to be, have a gauge that's running production and it's going to have an audit system later on for final inspection, we want to usually make sure that there is a correlation that we can make sure that two gauges from the two observ observations are going to render the same result. And lastly, the environmental conditions I'm working in. What is the part of the ambient environment of the cell? Is the ambient environment controlled or not? Is it, is it, uh, is it ex go run from extreme conditions? And the other is, of course, the temperature control of the machine. Is the coolant controlled? Is the environment of the machine controlled? Because if I want to maintain accuracy, I can only tolerate a three degree C change in coolant, and the rate of change I can tolerate under normal conditions is one degree C per hour. So a lot of things that we have to look at when we consider what we're going to select to do the proper gauging. And this involves everybody in the picture, between the end user customer, the machine provider, and of course the gauge. It takes a team to make the process work well. So now we've, we've got our environment, so now we need to take and decide what we're going to do as far as the pre-process gauge. Again, we're checking internal diameters that we're going to, we're going to pre-check so we can grind an OD to match. So plugs is our normal system used to check these. And what do we normally can have for plugs? We can either use contact plugs or pneumatic plugs. So gauge plug selection is, is some criteria we can look at for that. Under the contact type plug, we have a choice. Two contacts to measure a straight diameter, four contacts. And, and the choice between these two, of course, is going to be as we did for conditions of the chordal correction issues. Do I have a large enough diameter where I can get away with two contacts and because my chordal correction is not going to become such an influence, the tolerance of the process and so on? In the case of do I have a process where my, my chordal correction is, is or my chordal error is going to be something more concerned and possibly the condition of the pre-machine part might have a roundness condition. I may want to use contacts in multiple locations in two planes so I can look for roundness conditions as well as correctable for chordal error. Or is the bore very small and a simple check where I can use a single contact against two references? So these are choices I can have for that, and this is examples of contact type plugs that would be used under these conditions. Under pneumatic plugs, again, very similar to contact type, I have can use two orifice, four orifice, as my contacts are, or annular ring in the case where I have uh, a, a deep bore and very little area to get, uh, get uh, access to, as well as roundness, I want to eliminate any kind of roundness check problems. 
examples again of, uh, of uh, pneumatic type bores. So the technology choice of the forest is contact plug. Contact brings us the ability to have uh, a, a measuring range of 50 microns within a, a setup. Um, diameter ranges I can run between 8 and 30 millimeters with depths from 2 to 150. Contact electronic gauges gives me long-term stability and only requires mean mastering. The pneumatic plugs, though, are not to be discounted, but they bring us the ability to go to smaller diameters and deeper into it. So if I have a small, deep diameter, usually pneumatic might be the, def the default I have, much, I have no choice but to go to just because of accessibility. I lose measuring range because I have to measure back pressure from the air and I start getting too much clearance, it becomes an unusable. And I also, as shown here, requires two masters, a max and a min, because of, with the air gauges, pneumatic type gauges, you always have to verify sensitivity or spread as is normally used in the term. So let's look at applications we've done. Here's cases where we've done pre-process check combined with feedback from different, uh, from different inner grinding machines. So I, here's the case where we're grinding, we've ground uh, part on several operations and we have to pre-check measurement in three locations, a distance to a seat, and, and this measure, this diameter up in the, up in the uh, uh, smaller end of the valve. So we have a gauge similar to this that would be auto-loaded. And we would check the measurement, the part. That value then would be fed in and controlled it. Other systems in process gauging with reference to combine more than one value. So here we look at a process where we're grinding some operations to this uh, seat, this body. We have two measurements checking here along with taper a and a seat depth. And what we're going to grind is we're going to grind the body of the plunger and the finished length of the plunger to get to this distance. On the op under operational two, we're going to check the seat distance and the thickness of the two shims that make up this assembly. And then the final, what we grind is this length from the to the end of the plunger to this finish length here that goes against this one shim, and then the seat. And at the end of it, we have a post-process check. see how we do have length checks as well as the three diameter checks, one, two, three, well, four diameters, sorry, four diameters, and taper between these two. Okay, here's a case where we're checking in two locations with taper control as well as in NC. As you can see we're grinding this diameter in a pre-process, and then we're, we're grinding these two, and there's going to be a taper control between the two. So we have our pre-process gauge system here using a, uh, a plug to check the body, and then the in-process gauge is controlling the process here along with uh, uh, the, uh, the finished uh, taper control. Another system we have is gauges that we take and check internal diameters of bodies such as this, and we can take and measure the, uh, store the measurement data. As parts are manufactured later on, we, we match the pieces to the stored data that comes in from the pre-process gauge. So in this case here, you can see the schematic. We have our pre-process check going up, sending the information to the in-process gauge. The in-process gauges controlling it along with taper, automatic taper control. And, and then on the, uh, at the finish when it's completed, over to a post-process gauge. So we take these pieces, we grind the other pieces that fit into it, we check them, and they go together. Under the, under the uh, interrupted parts or smooth parts, we have to look at how we want, to, how we want to, uh, to control the process. Here you have ID grinding maybe after honing or after grinding. You can see your production spread and your OD grinding is, all, is out of control between the two. So you, you can either take and produce it, uh, match grinding with an external dynamic and reference the bore in order to try to create a part that falls within this range. Under this type of stuff, where we have a 
check on the bore. We're going to do it in uh, two measuring positions, and we're going to control the OD grind to match those two positions. You can see we scan the top, now the new bottom, and we can control the process. So now when we produce the parts, our OD grinding is kept under control in a nice tight range and still will fit into our, into our parts. Uh, another system of, of matching, which is a little different, is glass of class uh, grinding, where you produce the parts. Uh, your pre-process is already done in another location. Your parts are classified. Your sleeves are classified, and then those classes are put into the in-process system, and we control the the process of grinding to match those classes. So, but it does put spread your uh, capability out a little bit. Lastly, we a system of measurement for match grinding that we do a lot of is, is um, uh, scanning. Scanning is a, is a technology that is becoming more and more relevant because of closer and closer tolerances and, and gives us a lot of abilities to check the variabilities of the part. So what does scanning do? We scan inside diameters or outside diameters. It allows us to visually see how the two pieces will, will match. It is a system of process control. We can maintain statistics on it. We can check it in, in the cases of, of the way it looks with the distortions due to clamping. We can also detect if we have issues with grinding wheels, such as if you start to see a profile uh, start to go where the grinding wheel may need to be dressed more often than expected. Um, we can guarantee perfect function of the part because we can look at the total clearance across the uh, uh, surfaces as well as the lifetime of the product, which is, falls into the FMEA by the, controlling these processes. You can control the, make sure that the part quality is high enough to allow the uh, life uh, expectancy of the part to be within what you expect. So here's an example of a contact type gauge that scans using a single diameter diamond contact. We have a plug mounted on a floating device, so when it goes and enters the bore, it'll find the center on a motor-driven slide with a scale, so we know where the position as we go through. So you see we have our contact measuring each land as we go along with two references. Okay. These are types of solutions that we have to have. Again, it takes a partnership for the successful application of, of in-process gauging on your, on your match grinding cell. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Frank. Okay, so we're coming to the Q&A session of this uh, webinar. And um, again, match grinding is very complex. We covered a number of basic aspects to it from uh, the gauging and the grinding. And, uh, but we would like to give you the opportunity to ask questions, or some of them may have already sent any, uh, some questions. And I would like to allow um, uh, Tom Vieira from United Grinding here to answer some of these questions, and or uh, Frank, depending on who they're addressed to. And again, I would like to uh, thank you for uh, considering us uh, in this webinar. All right, thank you. This is Don Nelson again. I just want to thank Hans and Frank for an excellent presentation. Um, we're going to turn to some of the questions. And the first one is for Tom. Is feedback from flow test stands ever used as part of the post-process gauging system? Yeah, typically when we use a, a flow bench like that, we're typically grinding shoulders of, uh, of uh, spools. So we will grind the, the length or a width of the, the spool. So you'll have maybe four or five lands on that spool that we need to grind, put in a flow bench along with the, the mating part, test it, see where it's at. Those values will be fed back to the machine uh, through a macro, and then we regrind that part based off of those values and recheck it again to make sure we ended up where we needed to. So that, that's typically how we go through and, and flow bench test some parts. All right, thank you. Uh, second question that we have, which was asked early on, is does the system only OD grind? Where are the IDs ground? And on that, typically the IDs are ground prior to, uh, to this whole system because we're trying to match grind the OD, which is easier, or easy, which is easier to control uh, with a gauge onto uh, the part than it is to put a gauge inside the bore while we're grinding that. So we will grind all the bores on a machine, 
measure and uh, measuring those, holding those to a certain tolerance. From that, then they'll go into the system where we can put them on a station, measure the IDs, and grind the ODs. All right. Um, that looks like about what we have in terms of questions. But as, as you're uh, reviewing it, thinking about it, if you have something comes to mind, you can see uh, the email addresses for our participants on the screen. Uh, please feel free to email them your questions, and they will get back to you as soon as they can. Thank you.